Hello and welcome to My Security TV in our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the director with My Security Media. Uh, and today we're looking at smart factories and advanced manufacturing with uh, Dr. Jens Goneman, the managing director with the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre or the AMGC. Uh, Dr. Goneman is here in Sydney, uh, but we're obviously going to be looking at a national priority for manufacturing uh, and looking forward to this particular interview. Uh, and then we're going to be crossing to California and we're looking at virtual reality and decision tactics. I raised this on Tuesday. I didn't know what the T stood for in terms of VRDT is the term that they use. Uh, and the state of California is going to commence uh, training uh, for their officers uh, in the state of California. So uh, looking, with, uh, looking forward to speaking with Eric Perez, Director of Virtual System Sales uh, within Veris Training Solutions. Uh, and I'll say good day to Eric when he signs in. Uh, for those who uh, may be following us or for the first time, we cover on aerospace and space, defence and national security, cybersecurity and critical technology and cities and infrastructure. We should be streaming on YouTube, LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, and we also cover the Cybersecurity Weekly podcast. And otherwise, you can go to mysec.tv uh, and tune in from there. We tend to go for that 30 to 60 minute range. Uh, today, we may go for the full hour and uh, it's conversational. So please say good day. Tell us where you're listening from uh, and press like to share us out to your colleagues. On Tuesday, I've lined up, uh, we're going to be crossing to Japan, I believe, with Dr. Den uh, Dennis Kengo Oka, uh, who's the Principal Automotive Security, Re Security Strategist uh, with Synopsys. And we're looking at the attacking of automotive keyless entry systems. Uh, and he's done some analysis on that. So we'll talk about how easy it is to break into your Tesla. And then uh, just a, a cast back to... Uh, earlier this week, we crossed to Aidan Tudhope, the Managing Director with Macquarie Government, looking at their new data centre in Canberra. And then we also, and this might uh, be of interest to uh, Jerns as well, with, uh, we crossed to Travis Reddy, Dr. Adrian Pudsey, and Associate Professor Matthew Cleary looking at, uh, and they were 3D printing this, uh, rotating detonation engine for space launch. And, and that one is, both of those interviews have been edited uh, and are available uh, on MySec TV. Also this week, we released our podcast from Jane Lowe, our Singapore correspondent with Dr. Gagliardoni on cryptography. Very interesting podcast if you're looking at quantum computing and quantum security. And he demystifies quite a bit around that, explains it quite well. And then on Monday, I'm going to release uh, the next uh, podcast from Jane looking at crypto crime and particularly during the 2020 pandemic year. Uh, with Kim Grauer, Head of Research with Chen Analysis. Uh, and I'm not too sure where Kim is, but again, that's going to be released on Monday, which happens to be International Women's Day. And as part of International Women's Day, we are partnered with Bonnie Butlin uh, and the Women in Security and Resilience Alliance, or with SECRA, and we're launching the Top Women in Security ASEAN region. Uh, there's some 25 supporting partners and organisations, uh, including ASIS International, ISACA, and ISC Squared supporting these. So you can go to uh, womeninsecurityasean.com and check that out. Nominations open on Monday. We are being supported by RSA this year, RSA Secure ID Suite. Uh, we have some SCADA and ICS cybersecurity courses. I'm just going to run through these. We're also being supported uh, this month with ALC and their cybersecurity certification courses. So please check that out. It's on the Asia Pacific and Australian Security Magazine websites. Uh, and uh, some good deals there and some obviously that's certified training. If you want to support the channel, uh, go to the mysectv.shop and you can buy uh, some of our merchandise there. So look, that's it flying through. And without further ado, we're going to dive into Smart Factories uh, and Industry 4.0 with Dr. Jerns Gunnerman, Managing Director with the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre. Jerns, thank you for, very much for joining us. Yeah, morning, Chris, and uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you. And uh, let me, in fact, uh, I will check that we are streaming. But um, if you don't mind, I think uh, pre-interview, we were talking about our, our sort of previous dealings with OSCyber. So we have discussed sort of the government's innovation centres, and the AMGC is one of those. Um, and you've been managing director since the start, 2016, 2017, um, I believe. So maybe introduce yourself and you've got a fascinating background, uh, but also uh, what the AMGC is up to as well. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, so the Growth Centers um, is an initiative starting in late 2015. And the idea back then uh, was to focus 
in Australia on what we are good at. And instead of doing everything a little bit, um, we, are, we are trying to be very good um, and globally competitive in areas where we are already winners. So it's not about picking winners. It is about focusing what we have and be globally competitive. And manufacturing as such as the capability which cuts across all the other sectors in which we are good. Hence, we not only had five and now six growth centers to start with, but now we have six national, wait for it, manufacturing priorities. So that's, I think, where we have changed the language on manufacturing, which is great. Now, we do have some slides to share, and uh, we'll walk through them if you can. And you, you call this the smiley curve. Maybe talk us through this. And I think also you mentioned some 3,000 uh, within your uh, sort of group or member base. Maybe talk us about how, how you've scaled uh, since your launch. Yes, indeed. Look, um, there's a deeply wired misunderstanding in Australia what manufacturing is. And when we say manufacturing, uh, very often we only mean production, um, like, for example, assembling cars. That is a difference from manufacturing cars, I can tell you that, and we all know how that has worked. So um, manufacturing is a process consisting of seven steps. Research and development, design, logistic, production, distribution, sales and services. So if you look at Apple as an advanced manufacturer, Apple does all the smart stuff except the production part. They have outsourced it to Foxconn. Uh, in other words, the more value-adding parts of the manufacturing value chains happen before and after production. And this is where we need to see Australian manufacturers to pivot a word which I learned last year, and we can also see that almost now over half of the Australian um, manufacturing worker are working outside production already. And this is where the higher paying, more resilient jobs are, the jobs which make Australian manufacturers globally competitive, and we need to be better, not cheaper. Where would you say we're strongest here? Um, Manufacturing is a capability which cuts across all sectors and we can find in all sectors, wherever something is being made, something manufactured, we have in our network, we have now almost 3,000 members, um, we can find areas of excellence all over the place. What we lack in Australia is scale. We need to get our small uh, companies to go into global markets, be better, combine the efforts with, let's say, for example, in defense with global primes and uh, and embrace the strengths they have. I've just brought up the next slide, as you've kind of mentioned that in terms of the value add comes from making complex things. The yeah. changes in manufacturing and the technology, is it is it kind of cheaper to create a, a smart factory now in terms of 3D printing compared to the old industrial style? Well, whether it's smart and hard or not, we have no choice. Uh, we want to be better, not cheaper. And Australia as a country is not known to be having low wages. We have a certain standard of living. We cannot compete on cost. We need to compete on value. And um, the way you measure a country's capability to make complex things is measured in the so-called economic complexity index. That shows you what a country is capable of. And on the chart here on the left side, you see the higher the complexity a country can make, uh, the higher the income per capita. So you see logical, a logical correlation between low complexity, low income, and high complexity, high income. So on the upper right-hand corner, you see all the countries who can make complex things like submarines. Now, where's Australia? Australia sits in the high com income bracket, but in regards to complexity, Australia in the economic complexity index ranks between Burkina Faso and the Senegal. Now, that is because we do a lot of commodity extraction. We call it dig and ship and selling each other houses and have a service-oriented um, and commodity-oriented uh, economy. But what we don't do is manufacturing enough. We don't add value enough. And this is where you can see other countries who have also a lot of commodities like Canada and Norway, but they're moving to the right on the economic complexity index. And this is the journey Australia needs to go. Um, we consider manufacturing the most promising capability to transform a lucky country into a smart country. And in other words, adding value to commodities rather than dig and ship is called manufacturing. Well, we we had a we mentioned that pre-interview as well in terms of our raw resources and lithium batteries. 
and lithium itself came up yesterday, uh, today, but also there was an announcement uh, yesterday from the Prime Minister, I think uh, your colleague mentioned. So maybe just talk us through what we should be doing more of with our raw materials. Well, the Prime Minister um, announced um, um, a um, funding stream and an effort uh, with Critical Minerals, by the way, at a company site, Energy Renaissance it's called, and they do a project with AMGC. So well chosen place. Now, in regard to commodity extraction uh, and in regards to critical minerals, uh, let's not repeat the mistake we have done with steel, uh, not even to speak about coal, because even if we have a lot of coal, nobody will buy that in 20 years because uh, fossils is not the future. So what we could do and should do and are on the way to do is um, instead of extracting lithium and send it elsewhere, mind you, lithium battery has 10 minerals and nine of them are be found in Australia. So we are in a unique position and by adding value to the commodities we have in excess and extract, by adding value, every value adding step, which again is called manufacturing, every adding step is a multiple of value um, than the previous one. So extraction and two steps onshore would enable us to make much more out of our critical minerals and of our commodities than we've done in the past. Okay, well, I suppose that's economically, this is kind of brings up the next sort of slide as well in terms of what that can mean uh, for the country. And we, we, we covered this with um, semiconductors recently with the University of Sydney, and I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes with that in terms of the supply chain of things like semiconductors that that should be manufactured or we could have sovereign capability to manufacture and the business case of that uh, being able to supply raw materials through to manufacture uh, how much more value add you get and so much more where are we on this scale maybe explain through the, the sort of the job opportunities in this space as well well Last time I checked, we live in a capitalistic uh, system and um, it works by, you know, as long as you can pay your bills, you're in, if you can't, you're out. So we need to be competitive. We need to be able to make something what somebody else wants from us. Not just doing something because it is cool and we want to do it because other countries do it, like assembling cars. We have assembled cars for other countries, for Toyota, for General Motors, for Ford. But we have not been successful in that because otherwise we would have seen Holden's driving in Japan, in Germany and in the US like Toyota's, um, um, BMW's and Ford's driving in Australia. So that's not working. We need to be better. We need to be uh, embracing the entire value chain of manufacturing. The way we do that, um, and you can see that on the slide, um, we, we have done about 80 collaborative projects. That has cost the taxpayer nothing more than $90 million. But the companies we chose are the companies who advance the envelope, who are globally competitive, and to employ more people and have a product. We have manufacturers we do projects with there are 20 people, but they export into 80 countries. And these projects, which demonstrate the research we have done by being better, not cheaper, by um, embracing, the, embracing the entire smiley curve, by tapping into global markets with 6.5 billion customers and not 25 million customers. These are projects which create out of $90 million, 2,400 jobs. And um, that is an, a massive leverage for direct jobs. But every job in manufacturing creates more than three and a half times jobs in adjacent um, areas and they are indirect jobs. So we speak about eight and a half thousand jobs. These are the jobs which are resilient, which are higher paying, which are competitive. These are the jobs which stay. Do you, and again, we covered off uh, quite a bit on with off cyber in this in terms of cyber security and skills development in that there's a bit of a skills challenge uh, perceived in, in cyber security. Uh, do you find the same thing in advanced manufacturing is then getting the skill sets and then making sure that our curriculum and our schools and our universities are producing industry ready uh, jobs or people ready for those jobs? Let me, let me reframe that skill topic. Five years ago, people said, why the heck do we need manufacturing? Um, and 
the, the, the manufacturing question, the demand for manufacturing has completely changed. Suddenly, we have national manufacturing priorities. Now we all really be manufacturer, and I think that's great. So in that regard, we have changed the discussion, mission accomplished. Now we have people asking for more skills. Well, I think that's a good thing. I, I, that is a problem I like to have, because if we have the demand for skills, the supply will follow. Just saying we throw more people on the market who have a STEM uh, degree and then don't have the demand of an employer who has hmm. really competitive jobs to satisfy, to take that supply, it wouldn't work. So the supply of skill will follow. Yes, we need different curriculums. Yes, we need to attract young people into manufacturing. We need to attract them into STEM education. And by having a manufacturing capability and national manufacturing priorities in exciting areas like space, defense, recyclables, they are, they are ticking all the boxes of what young people like you and I and even younger um, getting excited about. Where is it, while we're on the skills question, is there any particular fields that are sort of leading the pack? Um, I mentioned we spoke about the rotating detonating engine. There's a whole range of sort of engineering skills in the background on that particular project. And just looking at the ones up on the screen here, is there any particular area, you know, what, what type of advice would you give for someone who's going, okay, advanced manufacturing, sort of advanced additive type uh, materials as well. There's a lot of science involved in this. Um, a profound, broad STEM education, you can't be wrong with that. Um, and uh, over a lifetime, the demands will change. So it will be a lifelong learning and um, be across the STEM areas you are uh, you're embracing. I wouldn't uh, put my uh, mm. money on one over the other. And uh, look, I'm an economist, um, and for 25 years I didn't really use my studies. What was helpful for me is to use my uh, academic problem-solving skills. Um, and uh, uh, if you are STEM educated and you have an academic education, I would think with that understanding you're well placed. The difference to a couple of years ago is simply that Australia. And a bit of thanks to COVID, but I think it also has to do that we have hope changing the, the discussion about manufacturing and put it back on the map. This country wants to be a country which can make complex things. We want to be less dependent. We want to be better, not cheaper. And if you choose a career in that area, whether it's be an S, a T, a E, or an M, go for it. Fair enough. Well, let's, uh, before, while we're conscious of time, uh, and let's finish off on actually talking about some of the projects as well. And again, we, uh, and I recommend people go visit, uh, in fact, I'll put it in the notes now, but the amcg.org, amgc.org.au, uh, and I'll just stick that in there for anyone who wants to check it out. But there's a heap of projects on. And we've just uh, sort of nominated uh, four or five, and I can see uh, Gilmore Space and Black Sky uh, Aerospace is on there. Maybe talk us through that. We've had Gilmore Space on uh, previously. Um, how you would be assisting uh, sort of those companies there on the, their projects? Yeah. Look, um, the way we work is that we have thought about long and hard what makes Australian manufacturing competitive. And you know by now we have to be better, not cheaper. We embrace the entire value chain, not only focus on production. Um, and we have demonstrated that in our projects. We have done projects around 80 with probably two, 300 companies and with research partners, research partner who solve an industry problem, not industry solving the funding problem, mind you. And that are great examples, but 80 projects with a couple of hundred companies does not change the nation. This is why we also advocate on our manufacturing academy, on our website, how good looks like. So we have research um, examples, but we have also the project examples. And because of the capability in coming across all mm. the sectors and something being made, you will most certainly find one or two or three projects out of the 80, which are close to home and relevant for your field, for your company. And this is how we try to scale and get into the head of the other 47,000 manufacturers out there in Australia so that they can also follow the path and not 
think we can win the prize by being cost competitive. Um, they need to be better, they need to be co globally competitive and enter into these markets. Maybe this, these, um, the miniature thermoelastic stress analysis camera, uh, and again, maybe just going one step back on that is, how do you assist? Are you assisting, is it funding as well that you provide some of these? Is it sort of that industry connection to say, hey, have you thought about this form that you could go on or companies might come to you and say, we need, we're going to produce a new product, but we need a different material. How, how, how do you actually assist? In the last three years, we had $90 million and put it in little chunks with 80 projects. And now we have another $30 million which will be spent within the six national manufacturing priorities. And that's a broad church. So they are, um, the, the, the six priorities are the space, defense, medical, food and beverage, critical minerals, renewables and recyclables. And uh, now if you're not a space company, well, let me give you an example. We had a watchmaker, um, which was the only company in Australia, which is certainly not a space company, but that was the only company who could make a widget for a microsatellite because they have the machinery. And uh, so don't be shy to be outside of a national manufacturing priority as long as you can make a project you can deliver or advance a national manufacturing priority. So we have another 30 million on the start. The way we do projects, we match funding dollar for dollar in cash. And this dollar for dollar in cash means that we break a project down in milestones and we give you the money in advance. Actually, half of it is your money and half of it is ours. <laughs> and once the project is accomplished, we in fact check homework. So we want to see whether the project goes in the right direction. And this is why the projects are so impactful that we make with little, relatively little money, very competent project participants, we can, we can create so many new jobs and can be so competitive. Very um, good. And it's a $1.5 billion funded national manufacturing strategy and initiative. So watch that space. We have also funding opportunities going online one after the other. Yesterday about critical minerals, before that in medical, and before that in space for projects between one and $20 million, which you also need to match one by one. So there's money out there. You need to put the money where the mouse is and uh, and match the dollar for dollar, but that is the change of landscape uh, in manufacturing. Okay, so we've got still got five or so minutes, uh, Jens, and let's walk through these projects. And this is the one that actually kicked it off uh, that came across my desk uh, yep. and the Industry 4.0 project and developing a smart factory. Uh, talk us through uh, uh, Redark. Was it Redark? Yep. Redark. Redark. What a, what a, um, showcase for manufacturing in Australia. Red Arc had a product line of one uh, 25 years ago. Now they have 600 different products. Um, they make vehicle electronics, wherever there's a battery in it, Red Arc sees the market. So what we see here is an automatic brake controller. By the way, I have one, works fantastically. Uh, but what I didn't know is that this um, brake controller um, is assembled Remember the smiley curve, the middle part is assembled by cobots. So what does it mean? It means that a dull part, which or dull process, when we say in Australia, we are too expensive for that, has been outsourced to a brother or sister uh, cobot. Why a cobot? Because the difference between a robot and a cobot is a robot wipes you out when you come too close and has to be in a fence and in, in a cage. A cobot works alongside and um, I've tested myself if uh, uh, you come too close it stops so it is right on the factory floor and in the smiley curve of manufacturing process it does the assembly um, instead of a human now people say automation robots lead to lo jobs and losses couldn't be further from the truth the only jobs which are lost are in China our workforce is upskilled programs works with the cobots Every project we do with automation and robots has created new work. So there are two myths to bust today. Manufacturing is more than production, and automation creates jobs. It doesn't take jobs away. Very good. And are they universal robots in the background there? There's the main arm. Say again? Are they universal robots? 
they are universal robots and yeah. uh, there are three cobots in that station and uh, the uh, the workforce uh, has programmed them in a way uh, to adapt them to um, their, their 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 needs fantastic uh, fantastic setup okay and this one looked interesting too uh, visual stress monitoring and uh, it's we're manufacturing this camera are we I'd like to see Australia manufacturing a camera uh, it, that is true and it's a spin-off from the Australian Defense Department um, very often defense um, and we have, as we all know, massive defense procurements, which turns into massive onshore manufacturing uh, opportunities. So that is a spin-off. Um, and this camera, it is uh, um, testing of stress and structures in a non-destructive way and uh, is uh, something what also can pivot outside of defense to uh, check structures, uh, for example, yeah, structures under, under stress, such as aircraft wings, but also bridges. Nice, and I think we, I did get the media release on this. I think it's on our CTV buyers guide uh, as well. This one I looked at uh, a while ago as well. And this is Sharon Advanced Training Armor. And this is something that Eric might like in terms of his virtual reality training. Uh, I imagine you might be able to stick on this type of uh, armor, advanced training armor. You can start hitting, hitting them over the head, right? Yes. <laughs> the idea. Uh, it, uh, that is an um, interesting project as well. Um, you know, you, you know the the saying, "Train as you fight," and um, if you have an armor like that, uh, you actually can. You can, in fact, do this with lesser um, uh, safe armor or without, but you can only do it one time. So with this one, um, you can repetitively train as you fight, and um, the um, uh, has revolutionized not only the training for, let's say, defense and police forces but has also um, was making his way into um, the civil market. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, is that, I, I don't know, that's, um, I know, I think it was Lockheed Martin are putting on some advanced body armour for soldiers and the like. I don't know if it's related to that, but it looks very interesting. I think we might reach out to Sharon uh, and uh, get them to walk us through that. Very interesting. And I think the last one is Black Sky Aerospace, uh, solid state rocket fuel. This is obviously for our Space and Defense channel. Indeed, like um, the idea, I mean, you know, there are two types of uh, rocket fuels, the liquid ones, where you have to have a fuel and an oxidizer, and um, which has advantages and disadvantages. And one disadvantage is the storage. Um, with a solid state rocket fuel, um, you can basically, for a very long time, store it. And uh, we see solid state rocket fuels often in combination with uh, liquid fuels take the space shuttle the boosters at uh, solid fuel and um and the the big tank under the space shuttle was liquid fuel so has um the the idea here is that and this project we did with them like every project you mentioned uh, be meli calvin or red arc or sharon are all aimed with the uh, collaborative projects usually where we give in half the money and have a research partner and other companies to participate in case of Black Sky Aerospace, the outcome is that we establish a sovereign manufacturing capability for solid state um, fuel and rockets. And that is a nice thing to have. Um, we see uh, military applications and we see civil applications. Now Very we're not good. against uh, NASA and not against Elon Musk. We, these companies looking for a segment for an even cheaper way for lower payload into space. And as we see, microsatellites are the way to go, and they don't weigh much. Uh, they are basically a half shoebox. So that's what we can do from Australia. How much activity are you seeing in the space industry as part of your cohort? Maybe break it down into a percentage, because space, obviously, uh, for us, it's getting much more interesting and uh, much easier to reach out to people in the industry as well. Well, in the early days of um, um, the growth centers, I've propagated that defense needs to be a growth center type of a priority. And then we got the space agency. Here we go. Now we have six national manufacturing priorities. Four of them are covered by growth centers and two come online as well. Space is, despite defense with all the onshore manufacturing space and how that ripples into civil market and creates great jobs and gives us the ability to sustain and upgrade the defense procurements. Space is the same. Space is an exciting industry which attracts a lot of people. 
I mean, space has a lot of applications beyond space, doesn't only push the envelope of um, the space sector as such, but all a lot of adjacent sectors in which complicated things are being manufactured will benefit from that. So space is a great opportunity for Australia. Absolutely. And I think maybe let's just finish off on the language, uh, Jens, in terms of manufacturing is not a, a sector. You, you're describing it as a capability. Uh, maybe just finish off with how that terminology is now quite important. It is um, because by looking at a sector, we uh, would only very narrowly look at a production part, but you all know now with the smiley curve that manufacturing consists out of seven steps. And wherever something is being made, preferably something complex, something globally competitive, wherever something is being made, that is manufacturing. So we make a vaccine, is it the health sector or is it manufacturing? In fact, it's both. And that is the capability we need to have. And we could demonstrate during COVID that manufacturers in our network were able to not talk about ventilators, but they were able to build 1,700 invasive ventilators from scratch, 99.3% sourced out of Australia. That's manufacturing for you. Very good. Well, look, uh, we could have gone for another hour as well. And what we haven't spoken about is your skydiving uh, exploits as well. Uh, <laughs> let me just, uh, just to finish off uh, for the audience, uh, Dr. Jens Goneman uh, is also an avid skydiver. And uh, as long as, uh, along with having a PhD in economics from the University of Hamburg and a Bachelor of Business uh, from the Hamburg School of Business Administration, uh, he's the chairman of the German Australian Chamber of Commerce, a senior member of the Executive Committee for Industry 4.0 Advanced Manufacturing Forum, a board member of the Innovative Manufacturing CRC, a fellow of the Australian Institute Company Directors, and played a key role in the Prime Minister's National COVID 19 Coordination Commission Chris, Manufacturing Task Force. All to know that. The only thing people need to remember is manufacturing and production are not the same, and manufacturing is a capability, all the other things you can forget. I love it. Well, look, I'm going to your your profile. I can't do the whole profile, and I was trying to find the uh, the skydiving record uh, that you uh, broke in October 2014. Uh, I'll have that in the notes. Uh, and uh, very impressive uh, background as well. So thank you, Dr. Jens Goneman. Thanks for having me. Thanks for I Thanks. I'll put you backstage, Jens, and enjoy your day. Likewise. Bye. Okay, very, very good. And like I said, uh, avid skydiver, and uh, he's the triple Australian four-way formation skydiving champion. That's what I was looking for. And was among the 214 German skydivers who leapt into history, uh, 18 and a half thousand feet above the Arizona desert. So very good. Um, okay, so now we have, uh, we're gonna move over from Smart Factories and there's a bit of a segue there. We're gonna look at VRDT. Uh, which is virtual reality decision tactics uh, and virtual reality law enforcement training. And I'm going to bring on Eric Perez, Director of Virtual System Sales in Veris Training Solutions. Eric, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Beautiful American accent there. Where are you in California? So I'm in Atlanta, actually. So the <laughs> other side of the the, okay. the country there. Sorry, mate. I thought you were in California on the East Coast. So the timing uh, is probably a little bit different for you. So appreciate you extending your day. Oh, um, no, not at all. This is great. Thank you for having me. Good man. Look, talk us through, uh, well, maybe in various training solutions, because you've been with them for quite a while, 2001, I noticed. Yeah, yeah, I've been with them for quite a while. So um, a lot of people um, would remember a, a small company that was actually started in, in Atlanta called the Fats Farms Training Systems. Um, in around 2006, it was purchased by a company called Megat uh, PLC. It was a British owned company. And uh, just recently, uh, we were purchased by a uh, investment group called Pine Island. And uh, since uh, you know, Big Megat is has that name. We had to change our name, and so we went to Embarrass. So that's kind of the uh, the, the genesis. If, if if you're in the law enforcement community, if I said uh, a fat system, everybody knows it's kind of like the Kleenex of of, of training there. Fair enough. And you've got a, a a military background as well. So what what's your key role, and how is this all going to play out? Like, how much has this been in development? Because the state of California. Uh, according to the release I've got, is the solutions launch customer. This is all brand new. 
Yeah, so uh, it, it's been in development quite a long time. Um, we've actually done a lot of virtual reality inside of, uh, of the military side of the house. Um, and what we did for, for the virtual training for, for law enforcement was actually just taking everything that we knew from that um, and actually taking everything that we knew in, in, in our FATS days and applying it onto VR. Um, so my background or what, what my task was, was um, to kind of lead our sales team and, and basically get this, this launch for, for California. So that's been really good for us and, and we're very excited to roll it out to the rest of the world. Have you actually started? It looked like um, you are to be delivered and installed by March 1 this week. Yes. Yes, so we've uh, we've installed most of them. I think we're almost done. Um, I, I don't know the exact numbers, um, but we've installed over half of them now. Um, we're getting great feedback uh, from all of those all of those sites. Um, it's been a long time coming. We wanted to release it. Uh, obviously, you know how COVID, you know, kind of delays some of these things, and we just we really push through. And uh, you know, we work with everybody all over the state of California to try to get those systems built as quickly as possible. Well, that's a good point. This is across, um, let me read it, California's Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training, so CAP Post. Mm -hmm. So they they manage all of the state police and sheriff kind of training, do they? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So what Post does, so every state here in the United States actually has uh, what's called Police Officer Standards and Training. And, and that's kind of the guideline that all the police departments have to follow in terms of training and, and the standards that they have to be as, as a police officer or as law enforcement. And so California was really uh, progressive in trying to get, you know, this this out there. So they they knew that virtual reality is is an up and coming or emerging technology, and uh, we felt like it was mature enough that we could actually use it as a training tool, you know, to to build it out to to our law enforcement base, and that's kind of where the 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 good insertion was for the both parties. Well, you're going to be supplying a hundred scenarios with branching options, and and this is again just coming back to that. It's a virtual reality decisions and tactics uh, yeah. training platform. So you've got a hundred scenarios with branching options. So obviously, they, you make one decision, and there's a branch off that, and you then that might have to make another one or change your tactics. So I get that part. I'm ex-police as well, so I'll just. I've always wanted to play with this. Like even you know, 20 years ago, I was like, "Why don't we do VR training?" Um, although firing a gun's obviously much more fun. Uh, and then you've got 10 state mandated ones. So maybe let's talk us through the scenarios. Of 100 scenarios, how much of those have you brought over from the military, and or how much of these have been developed specifically for law enforcement? Yeah, so what we did was uh, for our scenarios, we we actually had a whole bunch of scenarios already from our FATS days, and we applied a lot of that logic um, to our system. So we knew that we needed to do vehicle stops. We knew that we needed to do domestic calls. We knew that we needed to do all of the things that, that law enforcement already does. It was just a matter of just porting that over and, and bringing, you know, that that know-how into the, the virtual reality world. Uh, the 10 specific ones that we're actually doing for CalPost we kind of sat down with their subject matter experts and said, okay, hey, we're showing you what we can do. We're showing you that, that the system actually has an embedded tool. So even though we delivered 100 and, and the 10 mandated ones, each one of those sites can actually go in and modify their own scenarios to have multiple changes. So they'll be able to have the changes of what we call, you know, from the very start uh, of, of a situation and then change them up as we see fit or as that instructor sees fit. So multiple permutations of the same scenario can be applied. Um, so, so that's it's a, kind it's of a gaming, a, gaming system, absolutely. right? Absolutely. So they're they're able to to, to take all of those little assets and, and basically do everything that you would do as a police officer. If I talk to you and I tell you, um, take your hands out of your pockets or or anything of the terms of turn around, that's embedded into the system. And so the value that we saw in the VR. For you, Chris, is I mean, you've seen the projected-based systems. We saw something that that we knew was was missing, and that's the perspective shift. I want to look around you, you know, to see what what is what you have behind your back. Or if I had another officer, I'd tell him, "Hey, look, go to the left or go to the right, so you can see what he's doing." And you couldn't do that with just standard video. And, I, and so, being in a virtual reality world, you can physically walk around that subject and be able to see and, and interact like you would in the real world. The We, we have done an interview or our Singapore correspondent, Jane, did an interview over in Western Australia 
I'm in Sydney, but over in Perth where I was a, a police officer in WA, they are now doing virtual reality forensics training uh, on okay. crime scenes and uh, almost similar where you have a, you know, a homicide and to train those forensics to go through and identify uh, points of interest and, and potential. Are you doing things like that forensic related training as well or is this decision and tactics only? Yeah, this is more focused towards um, the officers having to do those those right decisions and the tactics of doing that. Um, not necessarily the forensics. That is something that we've talked about. Uh, crime scene investigations and stuff like that. That is in our what I would consider our technology roadmap. But for right now, I think there's already systems that kind of do that. Um, so for us, it really is more of, of a judgmental or de-escalation of force training. Okay. And who... What's the process of a scenario and the development? And I imagine we talked about the gaming and the ga gamification of this. Is is it a game as well? Like, can you? Is this protected? You can't buy this. So, yeah. No, no, no. We we actually built a lot of that um, in house. Uh, so a lot of the a lot of the know how is actually it's using a, a gaming engine. Yes, I will say that. Yep. Um, but a lot of the way we've scripted the, the actual scenarios are very much in-house process where we we sit down with, you know, we have subject matter experts and basically try to say, okay, how do I start that scenario? Okay, well, you're going to get a call and you're going to have to go to this house or you're going to pull over this car. And then we, that's basically how we do it. Yep. We say, okay, you mm -hmm. pulled over the car. All right, what's the expectation that you want? You know, what well, are you going to imagine you would have uh, worked with either the state of California, but you would have potentially just filmed the training that they're doing now and then just virtualized right. it, right? That's right. That's right. And what we did instead of, you know, to, to your point, the filming, that's, uh, you know, that's the process that we've always done since the FATS days um, here using yeah. that 3D gaming engine. You know, you, now you're just dropping characters and, and entities into a uh, what we call in a town USA. So for you guys, maybe say any town Australia, you know, <laughs> we start building from there. Nice. What's the rollout? process so you've got to get the goggles out there uh officers being given the goggles or and the training facilities like how, how what's the rollout yeah so the rollout is uh, as long as you have a training room that has a uh a area where it's big enough to play in the 20 by 20 and i'll say this in feet uh 20 by 20 25 by 25 feet um as long as you can uh project what we call lighthouses into that area wireless uh headsets uh, once those guys put on those headsets they are inside of the scenario um we give them you know their duty weapons so a taser um oc spray uh if they're going to use a rifle or a shotgun they'll have those they'll also have a flashlight and basically their pistol and we have a multitude of pistols okay and i was about to say are they using real uh uh what's the word uh, equipment for want of a better word, but accoutrements uh, is what yeah. I was looking for. Um, are they using real? So if they're carrying a gun and they're, you know, it's a, a, a tactic related to a firearm. I imagine a, a heavy gun is better than a lightweight play toy. That's, that's correct. So the 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 weight and the feel of the of the actual weapon, the training weapon. So it's not a real weapon. It's actually a weighted uh, weapon that right. has a yeah. simulated trigger. So they they will see that in VR, you know, once you holster in in the real world, put on those headset, you know, you pull out that weapon, you will see that weapon as as a Glock or as yep. a PDA yeah. twenty. Uh, so they'll see those um, inside virtualized. And what goggles are you wearing? Are you using are they all the same, or are you uh, sort of playing around with different headsets? We we did play around with a bunch of headsets. Um, Right now, we're using the HTC Vive Pro I uh, just because um, it offers the best of everything um, that, that we wanted to at a price point that was that, you know, we could build it out for everybody. And it's not super expensive or, or too heavy or anything like that. So that's that's the one that we use for for now. How, how many uh, have you like, bought? Like just out of interest, it might be commercially sensitive, but like, yeah, how many? I, I, all I can tell you is hundreds. Yeah. Is that all hundreds? I thought it'd be thousands. <laughs> no, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, not yet. I can I can tell you we're we're in the hundreds right now. Fair enough. Okay. And I imagine from a business case perspective, you, if this is a two point five million dollar contract with an option to go to five million. Um, I think from a law enforcement community, and I have done interviews in in LA and uh, San Francisco, and I think I met with the. Um, 
former police, I think it was former police, but uh, the the mayor of San Francisco or the mayor of LA, I can't remember, it was 10 years ago. But um, in terms of the, the budget uh, limitations that they have on public safety and law enforcement, I imagine how, how serious are they about this where they can really supplement their physical training uh, just on space and the, and the frequency of training as well? How does that impact? Um, it's very serious. I mean, it, it, the price point that we're offering this is is really uh, relative to the training. So um, you don't have to have a ded dedicated space, Chris. You don't have mm. to find a, a, a room that you can only do this in. Um, the idea being is that we knew that a lot of customers have multi-purpose rooms. You know, they may do their, their defensive tactics inside of that room. They may have classroom. They may have roll call in the room. So the sensors are unobtrusive um, to everybody couple PCs. So, you know, in reality, the, the, the customer is not seeing a lot of what I would say a big expense. They're not having to, to invest in a lot of hardware. Um, really, it comes down to the software. I think the software is going to make the difference where you can modify a lot of stuff for a little bit of, uh, of money. What's, what's the resolution? So the HTCs are fixed on their resolution. Are you at 4K? No, I, I would say it's more like 2K um, to, to each eye. You, you know, one of the things that you want to look at is not just that, but actually the frames per second. You know, that really is what Correct, you have to yeah. look at. The refresh, well. the refresh rate is, is what the key mm -hmm. to, isn't it? Yeah. And what type of research has been done on this? Like, is there, have you got a research body or support at the background for benchmarking before and after and, and the impact that this can have? Yeah, I'm hoping that we can do a lot of that with CalPost and, and get the feedback, which has already started. We, you know, a lot of the stuff that we are we are actually working with CalPost is more towards, you know, let's let's do some enhancements on training. Okay, it'd be nice to have some of these things. We haven't necessarily done the what have we gotten out of it. What I want to see or what I'd love to see is is how good of a, a person learns how to to, mm -hmm. to apply those tactics. And I think that's going to be that'll that'll be a while, I believe. Potentially even debriefing yeah. might be good as well, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's, it, you know, to tell you that, that's actually really good. So the way we used to do the other systems, our, our projection-based systems, it's usually from the point of view of the officer, where Verdict has um, the ability to actually go from the perpetrator or from, from that victim, as well as what we call a God mode. It's an elevated mode where the guys can actually see everything in real time. So... We can we can do those replays over and over and over from different points of view. So that that is Ooh. also a game changer. So you can see it from the offender's viewpoint. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Um, <laughs> I'm aware that we're on live. I've, I've got to watch what I say. Um, so in terms of that, I mean that is really interesting. I've probably got uh, 300 other questions in terms of what we could go on. Uh, but the feedback so far has been great. And what's the sort of rollout on this? I'm surprised uh, California, as I say, that normally are seen as an advanced uh, state. Um, where where else is this going to be sort of rolled out? This uh, or this is a competitive field as well. You won't be the only mm -hmm. ones in this space. Yeah, so, I mean, we have other customers uh, uh, on the military side. The Marine Corps uh, law enforcement side has also bought a system as well. Uh, we've have a, we have a bunch of other little departments uh, inside of the U.S. Um, Chris, pretty soon, uh, we're hoping that we can get uh, a system out to our Australia office. I don't know if you know this, but Inveris does have an office no. there in New South Wales. Um, so the, well, they can the start advertising is, uh, with us then. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the intent, you know, is to get one there and really show it to the Australian market. I mean, obviously, we may need to change some voiceovers versus the, the Americanisms, but, uh, you know, that, that wouldn't be too hard. Okay, well, that's interesting. And I mentioned uh, Murdoch University. I'll, I'll put the link from Jane's interview with the crime scene uh, models that they're doing in the VR that they're doing on that. But, yeah, I, I don't think I've seen anything on the VR side over here but the simulation training has been around and obviously the adaptation into a virtual environment uh, is one. Are you doing any um, augmented reality related content yeah. as well and training officers to, you know, that this is what's coming where they, they might have a smart glasses and the like where they need to get used to 
uh, real life, but also augmented information coming through to them? Yeah, uh, we are actually. Uh, we, we're looking at augmented reality. That was one of the things that we threw out, you know, when we were doing the verdict system. Um, augmented right now, the, the biggest issue that we have with some of the goggles is the narrow field of view. Um, and, and that kind of is, is one of the issues that we knew that if we went out to market, um, it, it wouldn't take off as much as we, we thought it would be. Again, technology has to be the maturity from a commercial point of view before somebody like us can take it, you know, and that's, that's these larger companies that are doing that technology push. So we are doing a lot of stuff in the augmented reality space. Um, I would tell you in the future, you, you're going to be surprised of what, what, what's going to come out. Okay, very good. The other, the other challenge with law enforcement and public safety is it's obviously the last adopter. They don't have much money. And I believe even, I think it's even, again, WA Police, uh, they're just getting smartphones now, like 2021. So they're finally joining uh, the real world. But I um, also this week we carried uh, New South Wales Police Force here in, uh, in Sydney uh, going with a US provider for, uh, as a CAD provider. Uh, mm -hmm. and and the like so there is obviously that that u.s law enforcement link uh, much like the military yeah. link between australia and the u.s uh, as well so not too surprising well look uh if there's no or, uh, questions from the audience very very interesting and uh, given the time frame we'll finish that uh interview up very interesting just to finish off let's play i don't know i didn't know what the audio was but let me just play this one more time hang on a second from the start, and I'll add the audio and let's see how this plays, uh, and I'll bring it up. This should play. Get rid of that. So this is the virtual reality decision tactics uh, verdict from Inveris. Very good. Okay, well, it, it always makes a difference with American accent. I don't know how an Australian accent would go with that. Uh, it's always quite funny hearing an Australian accent in gaming platforms. Um, but look, Eric, thank you so much for that. Let me just shrink that off uh, as we do. Uh, but we've been joined by uh, Eric Perez uh, in Veris Training Solutions, uh, and you're the head of sales, I believe, director for sales. So thank you very much and appreciate your signing in. And also thank you, Adam, for organizing that. Thank you, sir. Good. I appreciate it. Much. I'll put you backstage. Cheers, mate. Okay, all the best. Absolutely. Okay, very good. Just to finish off, no, go away. We've had <laughs> that's an embarrass. How do I get rid of this? Hang on. Here we go. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting. And I just to finish off, given the time, uh, report of the day. This came from KPMG and GS1 Australia. Uh, and unlocking the value of tomorrow's retail. And I thought I saw that link here between AI and robotics uh, and also that transactional service provider and the savvy consumers. Um, so here we go. It's the ex experiential retail. Retailers are turning to experience as a powerful tool to engage, win, and retain customers. So check that out. That's on the marketplace. But these are the eight core trends impacting the retail sector which are challenging brands to adapt with speed and accuracy. And I think you're going to see that uh, not just how they manage their data, uh, but this one here, hyper-personalization. Use of customer-centric data is giving retailers the insights to really understand their customers' behavioral habits. If we're doing VR training for police, you can imagine you're going to be uh, looking into uh, customized and personalized VR experiences in the retail sector. So that's where that's going. Uh, also, the use of AI and robotics uh, becoming more uh, prevalent. So check that out on the marketplace, unlocking the value of tomorrow's retail uh, with KPMG and GS1. Now, on Tuesday, I haven't lined up the second interview yet. Uh, I have invited her. I'm waiting for uh, an RSVP, but otherwise we'll have some other uh, women in security guests as part of our International Women's uh, Day special and we're also launching the uh, top women in security asean region 2021 
on Monday as well. So the nominations do open. Uh, but on Tuesday afternoon, our Tuesday episode, we'll be joined by Dr. Dennis Kingo Oka from uh, Japan, who's with Synopsis and looking at the attacking or an analysis of attacking uh, automated keyless entry system. So that should be uh, an interesting one. Uh, otherwise, please support the channel. Uh, check out uh, My Security TV uh, and our shop for the merchandise, our cyber war series with China, Russia, and India as the advanced persistent threat. So uh, you can also get some different material there as well. Thank you very much for listening on our Friday episode. We'll be back on Tuesday. You've been with Tech and Sec Weekly. Have a good day.